Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be the Business of Data Cooperatives. I'll turn it over to you, James, to introduce yourself, the panelists, and begin our session. Thank you. Uh, so everyone, it's, it's exciting to be here. This is my uh, second Radical Exchange Conference. My name is James Felton Keith. I'm the chair of the Data Union here in the United States. I'm also a data rights and data equity advocate and uh, an activist. Uh, aside from me though, the interesting people here on the panel are what I like to call doers. They're all building something interesting. Uh, first up, we have uh, Shiv Malik from the Streamer Network. We have Angela Benton from Streamalytics. We have Eric Rind from Imagine BC. And we have Christian Linesberger here from Microsoft. Before we get into uh, all of their companies and what they're doing uh, specific to data cooperatives or what I like to call data unions, uh, I want to have them differentiate their, their projects for you. Uh, and I'm generally familiar with the projects. Full disclosure, I'm on an advisory board for the streamer network but I won't go easy on Shiv, who is here without any facial hair, which is rare, <laughs> at least for, me, for him online. So if you're looking him up, he might look a little different on here. But I'd like to just start with the, the project that I'm least familiar with, which is Christians at, at Microsoft. So as we go through our intros, and I'm, I'm going to get to everybody, Christian, can you lead in with, with who you are and and what you all are doing specific to data cooperatives at Microsoft, what does that mean for the largest or regularly largest company on the planet? I know you two are dancing back and forth between Amazon right now. Yeah. But, um, a company that large, what, what are you all doing specific to data cooperatives or data unions or whatever language you choose to use? Yeah, so um, my name is Christian Liensberger. I see introduce myself. Um, I am. Um, I work at Microsoft, and what we do here is um, we're looking at new ways for people to make money with their data. Hmm. So we actually just released an app um, into like through our garage, which is our incubation part of Microsoft, where you can actually go and like um, provide data that you have, like images, photos, to like different machine learning projects with full transparency, like what they're up to, what they're doing, and you can actually like monetize that data through that. Um, and what we think about is like, how do we build like communities? Like what would it be to build communities that can actually work together and provide data to different kinds of like aspects of like, you know, IT, right? In general, broadly speaking. Um, and looking at like how that would actually work for like Microsoft, like what are the things that we could provide for people to actually like make money with their data? And so that's things that we're currently exploring and we are a small team in the big company. Um, <laughs> But you know we are um, we work out of the office of the CTO, and so we are looking at like what are new trends, what are new opportunities, what could we do, and so it's like all currently experimental. So you can come and join us. The app's called Trove, um, like Treasure Trove, and so you can actually go and like really where, try it out. Where is it online? Is it at Trove.com or anything? Um, you just go look for Microsoft Trove. Um, right now we are in this thing called Microsoft Garage where um, it's like a, um, like a small part of the company where there's incubations and like it's a website where we have a bunch of small like projects. Okay. And this is one of them. Um, uh, but like you can just look it up, us up and you'll find us. We don't have like a domain yet uh, working on that. But you know, <laughs> we are um, really like um, right now. It's like an experimental marketplace, something for people to try out. People come in, give us feedback. Like we want to build it with the people, with the community. So you will also find it interesting that everything you send us, we will get back to you with like a personal email and like come back to you, which is like not always the case for big companies. But like we're really yeah. trying to see how we build this together with the people for the people. Am um, I am I wrong in assuming is this more of like an R and D? Uh, faction of the CTO's office at Microsoft is that? Yeah, it's more like uh, yeah, like R and D, like incubation, experimentation, trying out, like you know, um, with the people, like seeing what we could do, like sure. what we could change, right? So depending on how this lands and how much engagement we get, how people are excited about it, you could imagine that we do more in Microsoft about this, right? So sure. it's really up to the people to like tell us, like, does this work? Does it not? What do they want? 
so they can help make a change through this if they want to. So that's what we have to. So last question, are we, are you all familiar, you all being Microsoft or your department under the CTO's office, are you familiar with, with the three other companies on the, on the panel at all? Um, I actually had some interaction with Shiv in okay. the past. In the I'm not familiar with the, with the other two panelists. Um, so I'm super excited to learn more and to hear okay. more as well, like the audience does. Um, but maybe I was also hoping maybe this is the start for us to start some engagement with these panelists mm. as well. So sure. it feels like a good starting point. So since you're in Seattle, we'll go to the next closest person to you, which I believe is Angela. Angela, are you are you in California right now or are you somewhere? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually in L.A. Good morning to everyone. Morning. All right. Afternoon. Right. Morning. Morning to you. Morning. Morning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's let's just go right to you. So I'm, I'm generally familiar with Streamalytics. I know you all you all have a platform. You're building some tech and you started to appify different properties on top of that and you've been making some interesting news some interesting headway lately with partners and investors so mm -hmm. tell us about what is streamalytics and what do you all have cooking over there in Cali? sure so streamalytics what we're really doing is um building the future of what we feel like are data transactions between consumers and, and companies. And so what that looks like for us is we have B2C products that are highly targeted. Um, our first one that's in the market right now is called Culture, C-L-T-U-R-E. And it's actually focused on the African-American community. Um, and what generally happens is folks can either connect or upload a data source. We value it um, based on a proprietary algorithm that we developed. Um, and then we go through the process of refining the data, transforming it. Um, we do have some technology uh, where we apply basically a data standardization format because you know everyone on this panel is probably super familiar with all the different types of data that you get when you do a data request. And so um, our core technology is called the Universal Data Interchange Format, UDIF for short. And when a consumer actually uploads the data, we transform it into that and it goes into an internal API. We then have B2B software um, that companies can license to get access to these data feeds and aggregate. Love it. Um, I want to, so I'm excited about that because of the standardization of classifying and potentially valuing data as, as the unique sort of entity that it is. So with, with that, I want to uh, move to, to Eric, which, uh, so Eric Ryan at uh, Imagine VC, you're in the DC area. 12 miles from the White House. Oh, so, uh, there you go. Uh, so how how is Imagine VC participating in this space? Are are you all uh, doing anything similar to what Angela explained at uh, Streamalytics? I'd say we're closer to what Christian's doing. I'm interested in it's Microsoft there. Yeah. So, but Christian's, what Microsoft is looking at is, and Christian's in, you know, working with is just part of what we're doing. So, what we're attempting to do is create an ecosystem that's peer-to-peer -peer commerce. We want to disintermediate traditional third parties. And we're built on blockchain. And when I got enamored with blockchain technology, the promise of blockchain technology is exactly that. Disintermediate third parties and get back to trusted peer-to-peer -peer commerce. Sure. So the commerce we're trying to engage in is between the creators of the world and the consumers of the world. And you don't need a machinery in between it. Well, if you think of a model like YouTube, we're really tired of people giving their intellectual property away from nothing. I'm by far the oldest person on this panel and therefore lived in a pre-Google world. I see. No, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Where you never get, in the world I lived in, when I was young, you never gave your intellectual property away for nothing. You just didn't do it. It was called a salary at the minimum, right? <laughs> <laughs> so... That, that's our goal, right? You have to fight this concept of free. And that's where we move over to Christian's world, which is, hey, if we can get people's data working for them, then it becomes a barter of the credits my data is earning for me against now paying fair value for content. So 
big concept, have to make it easy. We've designed the software we think can do that. I love it. I love it. So, and I look forward to, again, it's a bit of an intro for me too. And I, I definitely, I, I want to play with all the toys. I want to see all the things. And, you know, I'm a politician, so I want to figure out what language we communicate to people with uh, in regards to how this stuff works. So uh, Shiv, who is, let me know if, if you agree with this, I would say traditionally a journalist, but is now this sort of crypto data entrepreneur <laughs> with, the, with the streamer network. You have a few interesting things going on in a platform, plus some amplification on top of it, and, and a currency uh, also that you're producing, the, the data coin. Um, mm -hmm. so, Explain to us sort of in a nutshell um, how streamer networks exist in, in this ecosystem and sort of what you all's objectives are. Yeah, so I was going to say, um, Eric might say he's the oldest, but looking at the gym behind him, I think he's the healthiest here. Um, <laughs> <My laughs> so, yeah. uh, uh, the, it, you know, I think it actually, this is wonderful, just hearing everyone else, because this is a very new space. It's a very old idea, right? The notion of uh, empowering people to own their own data. And like what Eric said, I think was very true. Um, uh, I mean, I can remember that world working as a freelancer and realizing, I mean, the Huffington Post for me was that big moment where I was like, hang on. You know, they sold out for 300 million, but they spent years saying, oh, we're all part of this collective thing, but someone took the money, right? Um, <laughs> and it wasn't the people who created the content. So, um, it, it, so what streamer is, uh, and so those ideas, I think, you know, uh, of owning your own data and Jaron Lanier has been very formative along with Glenn and actually, uh, you know, we're calling it data union because, uh, I met you two years ago at the last radical exchange conference. Is it two years ago? One year ago, one and a half years ago. Yeah. February. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. It was a minute ago. The world, because of COVID nineteen, the world it just feels together. like uh, yeah. The yeah, last two. I met you ten decades ago at this point, right? Um, like and uh, and you're using that terminology, data union, and um, and I was like, that that's that's what we should call it. So, um, but it, it's become interchangeable. So, what streamer is anyway? Um, to cut past a bit of that history, is um, so we're open source and decentralized, and what we've gone for is because we built, generally speaking, decentralized infrastructure. Um, and uh, specifically on the kind of network level. So we were specializing in um, sending data from one place to another. How do you do that in a decentralized network? A bit like the BitTorrent network, but for real-time data. So if you've got a kind of developer background, that's basically it. But uh, out of that emanated this idea that actually you could create infrastructure to allow developers to come along and build their own data unions. So not just the one data union in a sense, or it wouldn't be us, a streamer, interacting with individuals. There's so much, so many different types of data out there, so many different ways to exploit it, so many people who actually, in a sense, own, you know, the access to that data and could be sharing it with their uh, end users um, <clears throat> that, you know, we thought, okay, we'll just build the generic platform. That actually came out this week uh, in beta form, and we expect it to be uh, uh, in a, um, a new release to come out in September. Um, but basically, as a developer, you can come along and build your own data union. Uh, the question is, what is the data source and, and who are your end users? That's the only thing you have to answer. That sounds like a small thing, but it's not. Um, we've already got one group, uh, a group of developers, um, uh, who've, who've built what is a browser plugin. So their source is a browser plugin. It operates in your browser. You then go and permission the data sources in there that you want, and then you get paid. And we sort out the, basically the three things as a generic infrastructure the transport of the data from, from peer to peer effectively. So it comes, in this case, Swash, it goes from your browser to the, the, the data buyer. We sort out the marketplace and then we sort out the payment. Um, if you can do those three things, then you've kind of got this generic data union builder platform. Okay, so... And I was gonna say, we were probably all struggling with those three things, if not far more. No, I feel like there's such a big market. I don't know, I, I, Eric, was your hand up? You wanted to say something? No, I just cracked you. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, I do. I feel like, so yes, this is a very new space. We are some of the few people in this space. I haven't talked to some of you on the phone. I just realized there may be about 20 people, maybe 50 globally who I think have a, a grasp uh, on this space. So now that we know what you all do, I just want to contextualize this a bit and talk about per the radical exchange audience. And I only know this per the last conference that I was in, 
I was on a stage and sort of called myself a capitalist by default. And I talked about why I was interested in data. And it's not because someone was like, we're all nerds, and whatever. I'm not a nerd. It's not a title I'll wear. But um, I said, I am interested in capital distribution. I don't think capitalism is working, even though by default, I am that guy. And so I came to data uh, based on trying to find a tangible good, an asset of sorts, uh, that I could distribute value back to myself with. Now, when I use that language, I was attacked by this crowd, but not only that, I'm, I'm regularly attacked when I'm in the European Union around the word ownership and what that may mean. Because of the idea that a lot of our data that we're giving on our individual person is sort of validated and expanded or given its value through transactions with other individuals and or institutions. And so I, I wanna, I'm gonna go through everyone, but I wanna just know what your thoughts are in general on the fear, which is that even as we create this data asset class, right? And we both watch it proliferate via what uh, like Eric and Shiv are doing, and we place um, um, value on it via things that like Angela are doing, and those things go out into the market and they have, you know, increased sorts of value plays on the asset as it exists. How do we address the fear, which is one that's coming from the radical exchange audience, that an individual could just be bought and sold like a, a data slave, so to speak, since especially since we're here on Juneteenth, talking about something like the end of slavery, at least in conversations outside of, of this particular conversation. How do we make sure that we're not just changing the oligarchy guard from the folks who are in power now to the folks who will be in power in the future. And I'll just, I'll start with, with Angela, since you, since you woke up the earliest to, to wrap with us today. I mean, sure. what, what do you think? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so in the context of Juneteenth, I feel like um, an important distinction that we need to make is when you're a slave, you like don't have a choice, which is what is happening around everyone's data right now. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of data ownership, um, and, and in particular to some of the tools that are being explored on this panel, is we're actually giving people a choice to use their data, to own it, to sell it if they want or, or not to. And so I think that's a huge distinction between, you know, what the word slave <laughs> actually means, um, especially, you know, in in um, the day and age that, that we are right now, which is honestly, most of the big tech companies are powered by consumer data, whether they like it or not. And so, so that is, I think, a fair classification of, of what a slave is versus, um, you know, actually having the ability to say, hey, uh, I want to actually get my data and sell it and it's your choice. And, you know, as, as a human, you're making the choice to either do that or not. What, uh, any, anybody else on, on that? Just, a, yeah, because I'm getting yeah. some questions too, by the way, I won't read them right now, but everyone's going in to, they're moving in this space, but Eric, I, I believe everything Angela said, but I, I'll, I'll go even a step further and, and say that I believe we're in an age of digital colonialism, where you've got the tech giants using our resources hmm. and then selling us back the very goods hmm. from, yeah. the, from our resources. And, <laughs> and by my history degree, I remember we went to war over that, right? Yeah. And, that, and that's what, you know, that's got to stop. And, and I don't like using the word ownership. And I think that's the key there, James, is that I don't get into that word because frankly, again, I'm old enough. My fingerprints were stolen out of the office of personnel management. Nobody's ever given them back to me. So I'm never getting ownership of my data back, mm. but I want control of my data back. I want to be the one who makes the decisions over how my data is used, right? Ownership is out there unless we get in a world where we're in a cooperative environment with government and I'm born onto the blockchain and my birth certificate lives where only my parents and then I have the key until then there's no such thing as ownership of data, but through cooperation, the people working together, we can get the control of our data. And when we can control it, we can then monetize it. 
And then to get to your point about how are we just not taking the next generation? How does an Imagine BC not just become the next Google? Right. Well, we answer that question by saying, well, we've put the sharing of the revenue into a blockchain smart contract that requires a vote of the community to change. So we literally programmed against our own innate greed. Hmm. We've used the power of blockchain to ensure that I, myself, my shareholders, Imagine PC as general can't even change the terms we've agreed with, with our community. Yeah, I think in, in many respects, capital also often comes down to, to a contract, some sort of shared agreement. Uh, Christian, Shiv, any, any, anything on that? <clears throat> Yeah. So maybe if I can, um, if, oh, okay, Shiv. Um, no, go on, Christian, please. No, okay, Christian, so I, I'm always going to go to Shiv last. I'm a bit biased, so yeah, he's, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, yeah. Christian. So I think like when, when we think about this um, in our team here, one of the things we actually find really important is that, um, like Angela and Eric were saying, there's control, like you get to decide who you want to share data with, when, for what purposes, and things like that. But then on top of that, what's really foundational too is transparency, which like blockchain addresses and a bunch of other things can address where you need to understand like, you know, um, who is on the other side? What are they doing? What's going on, right? So you need to clearly like see that. Um, we also really think about fair compensation. Like, you know, you should be able like, um, Erica said at one point, like salary, you should get something for your data, right? Um, but then there's also these advanced concepts that we really think needs to be on top, which is like, advancement where people actually can build a career around that like how could you build a career around data how could you like specialize how could you become somebody that's an expert in this right um, and then also like voice which is really the part around community like um, eric was saying and they're really advanced concepts because um one thing that we found as we were exploring this space is a lot of people don't even know like the basics at the bottom like hey what's what is a fair compensation for my gps data a lot of people have no idea like you, they don't know like i asked people at, um, at the university a couple of universities and they told me between zero to three hundred dollars a month and i was like that's a big 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 like you know exactly. range and so i think it's really important to get the fundamentals with transparency control and payment and then layer on top of that idea of like you know advancement and voice um where i really like you think about communities you think about building like a living, a career around that. And so I think all these aspects are super, super important. So there's a, unless you have, unless you wanted to add to that, I was going to, someone is playing on this right now. So there's some questions coming from online. Someone, yeah, named, I was going to, go I was going to jump in, just say just a couple of points. So I wrote this um, longish essay. Uh, and I think there's another problem at hand, which you haven't spoken about. And the essay was entitled Privacy is Dead, uh, Long Live Data Ownership. And I think, you know, uh, you have to kind of take the world as it is. And at the moment, we're in a terrible place. You know, we fought this battle between kind of tech behemoths and uh, and I agree with what Eric says. It feels like a sort of sense of colonialism. Um, you could also call it, you know, data serfdom, uh, where it's kind of indentured labor, right? Um, uh, and that taps in maybe to the idea of uh, ideas of, of, of uh, Jaron Lanier and, and Glenn Wilde. Um, but uh, uh, but privacy has had this long stretch. I think privacy tools are great, but privacy as a as a kind of um, a tactic or a strategy uh, has failed. It's just really failed. You know, it only seems to, uh, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, but let me put it this in this way, which is uh, certainly with the pandemic, people have realized. You know, privacy allows you to say no. I'm not going to share my data. I'm not going to give it to you. I'm keeping this to myself. But it doesn't allow you to say yes. Here's how I'm going to share this productively, right? We all know we kind of need to do that, and we do it all the time. Um, that is what we do when we use Facebook. We're sharing our data with other people. That's the whole basis of social media, right? So how can you do that in a different framework? Because that is not a privacy. Facebook isn't private, right? It's not privacy enhancing. It's never going to be. The whole point of it is that you're sharing. You can only adapt to it slightly. And I think the ownership framework, uh, in that sense, does suit. And I think, you know, that distinction is always between tangible assets. Data is not a tangible asset, evidently, um, but, you know, more like intellectual property. And there's been lots of work on that, I think, um, by some of my uh, colleagues and, and associates, um, Maria Savona, especially, where, you know, it's more like a book. It's more like ideas. You license these ideas, in a sense, and it finds some harmony. I won't go into that more. But sure. privacy people, yeah, do have, uh, you know, there's some great retorts there about, you know, you basically, you can't sell your kidneys. So how, how is it that we could set up a world where you might be able to sell your genetic code, for example? 
So you know, it needs it needs uh, structuring. It's not it's not hopefully going to be a wild west. Well, yeah. So that that makes me think about well something that Christian touched on briefly, and then a, and a uh, a question is coming in from online. And forgive me if my head does this. You know, this Zoom world is weird. I'm reading another screen of I'm not ignoring anyone or checking my emails. Um, but yeah, so someone is Maria is asking, hi all. Can selling data be a full-time job? Now, before you answer that question, I like to think about, you know, when I first met Glenn, for instance, like we spent a lot of time talking about markets, how we're both, you know, fans of markets if they have enough regulation on them to allow uh, good assessments, good predictions of what what true value is to proliferate. And so when I when I think about that, I think about sort of how the equity markets and the commodity markets work right now. And you have a lot of different analysts playing on sort of what that value is. So to Eric's reference of zero to 300, that is a pretty big gap. It may not be if we could, you know, crowdsource a lot of analysts or maybe even some sort of professionalism into what true value is. That said, Angela, what are you all, if, if you can share What's going into this um, valuation that you all are putting on data? And let me know if that's the wrong word. Just the way I'm interpreting the things you're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going, they're placing a valuation on data in their bucket per that market of like right. culture. Uh, sure. So we, we basically, you know, like everyone else on the panel, <laughs> ran into the issue of like how much is data actually worth? Um, and, um, you know, to Chris's point, it's it's just such a wide range. Um, and so I don't think anybody disputes that, that you know, individual and consumer data is um, valuable. It's just the question of how much. So what we did, um, and I can't go into to too sure. much detail, but the algorithm that we developed basically looks at um, public company stock performance, market capitalization. We look at some stuff around um, how a product is priced, um, the engagement and growth of a product. And we come up with something that's called a DPV, data point valuation. And so that, you know, can be, it ranges from a fraction of a penny to, to several cents. Um, the idea is that when a data file is uploaded or connected, there are thousands of data points in those files. And so, you know, we are not of the mindset that selling your data and getting, you know, one to two dollars a week is fair because it's not. And so the algorithm basically helps us um, justify that based on, you know, really how well uh, a company is doing that actually has, you know, your data. We also apply different weights to different types of data. So your location data may have a specific weight to it versus, you know, your social media data. Shiv, how does that, uh, compare if at all to mm. stuff that you all look at at the streamer network uh, with the currency that you have like I know there are certain sort of business transactions that you all are looking at similar to the Eric and company where you're trying to get rid of this sort of OEM company the original equipment manufacturer go directly you know have transactions directly from data buyer to data producer being an individual but are you all addressing this the, the, the issue that Angela is at all the, the, the crypto net does your currency network do that for you how does yeah so I mean the, the token uh, that we have is there because one we're kind of open source um, and and so there's stuff about how we get funded um, but the the second point of that is that if you want to make microtransactions you can't do that through fiat right so it allows us in a decentralized way to run everything through a smart contract right um, can you define that for us I just I think yeah. it's, a, it's a bit wise in general, but let's go through the the nature of transactions. Like what you know, basically it's this. Look, if if you're gonna if you're gonna have the so what is data worth? It's worth whatever someone will pay for it. Is the blunt answer, right? It's not very helpful, but that's the truth, right? Really? What's your house worth? It's well, you get a rough approximation because you've got a good market, but actually, in the end of the day, it's whatever someone will pay for it. Sure. So. Um, now, when you've got a data union, for, from our conception of actually construction, because there's already, um, it, it, Swash has about 1,700 plus members, almost 2,000 members now. 
and it hasn't advertised yet, so it's all organic growth. This is exciting. There's some data that, union out there with 2,000 that, members. That's a data union app on top yeah. of streamer network names. They're well. using our system to kind of thing, but they, you know, they had a lot of work to do themselves, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, and basically, you know, if they've had their data value. So if they have 50,000 members, they start to become viable. And the data that they produce, which is basically people's browsing histories in real time, um, you know, what they do, where they go. So, you know, TripAdvisor, for example, very interested. They're like, okay, great. Well, we know what people do when they come to our website, but we don't know what they do in the rest of the web. Only kind of Google knows that, right? And they don't sell it to us. So we would like to know because where do they go after our website, right? Sure. Um, that's worth money to them. They valued it at X, X thousand, $90,000, I think they said, if when you get to a point that, of viability, right? Which is 50,000 to 100,000 in a specific region. So we're having those conversations. Um, However, if you're going to distribute that out to 50 uh, or 10,000 people, you know, $100,000, let's say, then you're going to be making microtransactions, um, you know, under a dollar each. And you can't use a fiat system for that because the bank will go, we, we can't give you, you know, <laughs> if you want to send a dollar to a million people, forget it, like go away or 100,000 people, like we're going to charge you a dollar 15 for that or whatever. And, and, the set, and the other part of that is that because it's not running through a bank, you're running through a, uh, a smart contract, which means basically there's a contract, which uh, it's gonna be difficult. No one wants to hear this explanation necessarily, but um, maybe Eric can explain it in a shorter way. But it, ostensibly it's, a, it, it's um, a piece of computer code, which its state is guaranteed by a blockchain. In this case, the Ethereum blockchain. So you can't fiddle around with it. But that's, it's like, no one person can go in and change it. And it just distributes the money out. Um, very uh, fairly in a way that everyone can read. This is what's going to happen. If you so send the money to this contract. It'll go out to all these people. So to that. So Eric, if you want to add some color to that, please do. But you've also got a question from a Jeremy online asking if your platform, uh, if your platform's functionality is similar to the Transco copyright that Jaron Lanier writes about in his "Who Owns the Future" structure. That's a lot of. Uh, Codeology for anyone listening. If you care to explain what that framework is, do. But if not, just elaborate on on shivs and and uh, and functionality. Again, uh, for everyone listening. Yeah, interestingly enough, we didn't even know. We started this about two years, two and a half years ago, and we didn't know what we were designing until we heard those videos Jaron put out in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with those, yeah. And by the way, he said that to, to the answer to the initial question is, he said your data could be worth as much as $20,000 a year. That's a good start towards a full-time job. And, and if costs come down, that's really close. But in those same videos, he said, hey, you're, uh, you're, it's mediators of individual data. And then we knew what we were doing. But the thing that really knocked me was when he said they act as a union. Because that's exactly how I think of Imagine BC. No individual can take on the tech giants and try to monetize their personal data on their own. We have to do this together, and therefore, you need software companies with a social conscience that will act on behalf of their true community and not on behalf of their shareholders and their own personal interests. Amen, Eric. <laughs> Amen, Eric. And therefore, you have to act more like a union, yeah. right? And therefore, we, we, we don't call it, we're a company, but we were even imaginebc.net, not .com, sure. right? Because we think of ourselves always working on behalf of all of our members, which are both businesses and individuals. And to Shiv's point, a smart contract is that. It's think of a, you know, rather than a piece of paper that could be stolen and modified, it's a contract of terms through code that is immutable and unhackable. And yeah. those terms can't be modified without a consensus of the community. And that's how I said, we have our own greed. The distribution of income is programmed into that smart contract so that Imagine BC can't wake up one day and go, wow, let's take a bigger cut. Go ahead, Chip. Yes, I was sure. going to say, so in, in to, to, to how we exactly action that was that, so Streamer doesn't take any cut of any transaction. Um, and Swash, in this case, the people who built that application, well, they should get rewarded, right? So, um, because what are they doing? They're, they're, getting uni uh, they're getting more members in, and they're also finding buyers for their product, right? For the product that everyone creates together. 
Um, they also have to build the app. So those are the three tasks that they do. But we put in the smart contract, you can only take up to 30%, right? And that means that they have to start again on a different system and make their whole other thing if they want to take more than that. Um, and at the moment, I think they're taking a little less than 30%. But that, that's, and then the rest, the 70% just automatically distributes to all of the other members. And no one can stop that process. And there. what we do is, Imagine BC takes 10%. So 90 cents of every dollar that's invested into the Imagine BC community is, is distributed out. Imagine BC, what do we do with our 10%? Well, we're, we're creating the technology to make this marketplace happen. We have costs associated with that. We're acting as the marketing engine. When we were figuring out what the split would be, we said 10% is a more than fair number for us to take because we're assuming the cost of essentially governing the marketplace, but more importantly, creating the marketplace. So we, we've, got, we've got about 15 minutes left, a, l a little bit under that. And um, so now I wanna explore like how this, how this may go in, in real time. And while I don't know like Angela's numbers, for instance, and full disclosure, everyone, I'm a total fanboy of, of what she's doing. Uh, you know, look her up online, but the adoption of the apps that they're coming out with have, in my opinion, like some, some, they're really big and sticky because she's got these these rock stars, uh, for lack of better phrases, who are who are also on board with the with these ideas and the products. So between an Angela and a and a Christian, right? Christian, how do you imagine something like if if uh, if Streamalytics is appifying? Um, you know, data that, that's coming from, from you all's corporation in, in some capacity and, and saying this, this union of folks is worth X amount of dollars per your overall, you know, revenue stream. Like when I think about productivity, I think about revenues, not products. So you got revenues, taxes, and then some profits after that. Are you, Christian, is your network also thinking about how do we respond from a, fiscal policy standpoint because you're, you're essentially you're acting like this this little uh government from a fiscal policy standpoint to potentially make disbursements if formidable arguments are made for those disbursements from unions of people in this case um uh, you know some of the some of the unions that that they're building i mean because i would imagine so an article came out about them and again, I don't know if Angela, if you want to disclose any any of this, but uh, you know, I know tens of thousands of people who are like, we're rocking with this particular app because it's going to get us paid for our streaming data, right? In companies that say Microsoft owns pieces of, right? Like an MSNBC. I mean, so are what we're doing, like, that? what we're doing right now is like we actually, um, because everybody talks about peer to peer and everything, so we do the our system is going to do the same thing. We want to like really build peer to peer. The price needs is something that's hard to like determine because like there's the thing like set with houses, there's like on Zillow, it has a price, but then when you sell it, there's a different price. So you have to figure out what it is. Um, and so we really like also like what we have is like, as we build this, like we want to build this community as well um, that can actually like, you know, <clears throat> monetize the data. And it's interesting enough when you go into our app right now and you look into it, You'll see a bunch of projects are actually from Microsoft, but we are actually like seeing how people can contribute and create this community as well. So it's not just like, you know, like we work with partner companies. It's also ourselves that is trying to like bring some projects through this to see like how we can change, like how we collect data and how we get data and compensate people for the data, basically, so that there's a more fair exchange. <clears throat> and, you know, and that's what we what we up to. So we I mean, if Angela has a bunch of like people that are doing this today like maybe there's an opportunity for collaboration to see how like you know this like we could bring some to her and she can bring to some to us and like build more of a, a combined um community around that it might be interesting so yeah i'll I, I actually um so so we are focused on um streaming data just because you know it we feel like it's the least intrusive at least right now um and particularly for the consumers that we're working with, which is the African American community. What's interesting about that community in particular is they're highly active, they're highly engaged. Um, a lot of times they're creating um, 
they're they're creating a really popular culture for lack of a better term or internet culture um, right now but none of nothing is really going back into that community directly um, further what's super interesting about what's happening with facial recognition is the training data that um, folks are training the AI on a lot of times it's not from people of color which is why most of facial recognition technology does not literally does not work um, and particularly on black women and so what could be interesting an interesting use case and we have some folks that are interesting in using some of our data from our products around training AI um, so that the AI that's developed is fair you know and equitable and takes into account people of color and so right. you know um, kudos to to Microsoft for you know their decision um, around halting facial recognition in, in IBM and um, yeah. Amazon even to, to some mm -hmm. extent, even though they only put theirs on hold for, for a year. But really Microsoft and, and IBM saying, hey, there's a problem with this and it's not identifying black people correctly. And so we're gonna, we're gonna pause on it. And so, you know, while we're focusing on streaming data right now, you know, we have the ability to get all different types of, of data and really partner with companies so that we are building a future that's powered by technology, but that's also equitable. Yeah. Uh, Eric and Shiv, would you all want to work with Microsoft tomorrow? And if so, how? I'm already yeah. working with, <laughs> I'm, I'm already working with Microsoft. Are you working with them now? Okay. Azure. <laughs> So, yeah, and we're not formally working, but me and Christian have spoken a good number of times. And, um, you know, as we said, look, it's a small play. And, and actually, you know, I know of Angela's work through through you, you James, pointing it out. It, you know, you said there's like 50 people in the world who basically kind of get this and are doing something about it and are building away. Um, so we've got 10% of people of the world right, like right here, right? Um, it is a very... <laughs> it's so right now, right? Yeah. It's so invigorating because it's like you know, as I said, it you know, it feels like a very uh, old idea, um, which is you know, it's taken technologically, it's very, it's fiendishly difficult to implement, and um, and it, it, but but you know, we're all cropping up roughly at the same time. Blockchain is a bit of that story, micropayments, um, sure. but also that moment, uh, it, politically speaking, is it feels is now. Um, yeah, so so with, with that in mind, with the last you know, eight or nine minutes or so that we have. <laughs> You know, I'm a business guy at the end of the day, uh, even though I think sometimes I, I seem like a politician to some people and an activist to other folks. I would love to know how the three of your companies, because we do have about 10% of the brain trust of the people who get this in the world in the same place at the same time. I'd love to know how you all can, can co-mingle, if that is desirable, with a Microsoft on what I'm often talking to people these days about what the next phase of you know data rights will be which has to be some form of portability, right? Because that'll create diversity in a development market, even if the data oceans are still what they are, right? And I think the only way that we dilute the big data troves and the you know few companies that have all of it uh, without, you know, I don't think that this necessarily destroys those companies, but it, it has to be with a sort of portability infrastructure, number one. Uh, but number two, I think there's a, a political feat of communicating to the world that this is even possible. And I'll just give one example without being long-winded. Um, you, you all are right, I think Eric and Schiff have said this multiple times, that these are old ideas. The problem is a lot of people, they get property and ownership or property being a custodian of it or distributing a thing. They just didn't know that number one data was property and that they owned it already, right? I think we can make those legal arguments over and over again. It took my brother-in-law who's a fireman to tell me he had to come around to understanding that for me and now he gets it and what can we do next? So with that said, from the three of you, we can go, you know, Angela, Eric, Shiv, how, if at all, you know, would you like to um, either work with Microsoft or a similar company to, to expand data portability and communicate externally that this is an opportunity for folks? Can, so, I, can I add one, one thing? Oh, really? go. Yeah, Just sure. jump in one second. I'm actually super excited to hear everybody talk about Jaron and Glenn. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because, like, I mean, they're like really influential in like our work right now as well. And so they it's work really there, though, right? We all ride around the same kind of like, you know, 
set of ideas, which is yeah. a good starting point, but like I, I'll, I'll let everybody else talk now. Yeah, full disclosure, Jaren and Glenn were from Microsoft, at least last time I checked. But yeah, but yeah. so, but Angela and Eric, what do you? Um, well, honestly, let me just say this first. Uh, I'm super excited to just even be talking with everyone because, you know, James, as you said, not a lot of people are talking about this. And I feel very at home just listening to everyone. And so this has just been um, a really great experience. I think, you know, it's, as far as Streamlytics goes, we're open really to working with and partnering with pretty much, you know, anyone. Um, so, you know, Shiv, what you're doing um, at, at Streamer, Eric, you know, at, at Imagine, and, and then of Chris, of course, at, at Microsoft. Um, I think we're in a really critical time period where we can really do some interesting things around partnerships and, and shape really the way our future society will, will operate um, from a data perspective. Um, and key to that is making sure that the data is actually portable. I've been doing some advocacy work around a federal data privacy law. One of my biggest concerns are that there will be a law that's passed that is not that, that will basically satisfy, satisfy big tech and not be really what, what people need, which is a portable standard. And that's part of why we started even working on the universal data interchange format. I'm not saying that that needs to be the standard, but a standard is needed um, for everyone to move their data from service to service. And it, it's not technically um, too complex to do. Uh, because you're seeing other services do it like with Prometheus and, you know, DNA data, you can take your 23andMe data over to another service. And so it's happening in, in other use cases and it, it, there just needs to be a standard where it can happen across the board. Eric? Uh, like Angela, it's not just Microsoft. I'm excited to hear what Shiv and, and Angela are talking about. And I see uses of their approaches within our environment. And interestingly enough, we, we actually commissioned Radical Exchange a number of weeks ago to write a paper for us on how Imagine BC can play cooperatively with other MIDs in the world because we're focused on one specific aspect of monetizing people's right. data. But I think it was Shiv who said it earlier, data is constantly being created and there's no way any single company is going to be able to embrace all aspects of data. So. There's no question it's an open world for people to cooperate with because together we'll get everybody properly compensated for all their data. No one company is going to be able to do that. Not even Microsoft, Christian. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think we all agree on that. Uh, I don't know how this thing is going to work, if it's just going to cut us off. So I'll let Shiv, you want to... Yeah, I'll keep it brief. We've got th yeah. th three things to say. I know we've got three minutes, but I'll, I'll keep it less than that. So one... Um, be warned, there are some pretenders out there, at least in my book, I'd say they're pretenders. And why, uh, they, you know, they kind of say, you know, you give us your data. And what they do is this, they basically give you air miles, right? So yeah. they're not really paying you. They're just going to give you a discount of this or a discount of that. Or yeah. they're asking you to make more data for them. And then yeah. they sell it. And, you know, and that, that's not right either. You're like, hang on, I'm just doing more work now for you. Um, right. That's one thing. Second thing, um, when it comes to the, the portability aspect, um, we already designed something which is like a, a demo which clicks into Spotify's uh, API, right? Um, and, you know, all these, lots of companies have obviously third-party ecosystems. Uh, and so as a data union, you just go, okay, great. We can permission the, the, the you as an individual can go and permission this third-party app, right, from Spotify to say, yes, 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 I'll share my data with this app. We've all done this before in some way or another, usually with Facebook. And that third party just happens to be a data union. The point is that Spotify at the moment can say, no, you can't sell the data. You can share it, and, and, but we get to control whether you, to kick you out or not. Right. Which um, uh, leads us to working with Spotify. Why can't, let's say it's Spotify, become a, it, its own data union? They sell, if they go out and sell the data, great. Then share it, revenue share it with their consumers. So we're, we're talking with mobile network operators, for example, on that basis. Yeah. Um, you know, and the last point is um, the broader portability rules. So like Angela said, in the US, well, the EU has, you know, got portability rules with GDPR and, um, and they're revising them. We've had a conversation after conversation with them in the last c couple of months. And they're really moving on this to really ratchet up that portability standard. So 
it's 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 your data and you get to move it to wherever you damn want um that that's how it might well work now next year which is going to be very exciting because that'll change the dynamic everywhere around the world too yeah no agreed i think they're gonna kick us out so i just want to say thank you all for 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 coming together this group was deliberately picked to be the, the non-faker crew uh for everybody watching these these this is the real deal here and we'll be doing uh, this other screen just went out so we'll <laughs> Well, I think we're at the beginning of this conversation. We need to find some time to have it again. And so I, I hope we can. Uh, I'm going to talk to the Radical Exchange folks about how we continue this specific conversation uh, and invite some more friends in. So I uh, appreciate you all's time. Christian, if you, if you have anything you want to close us out? Oh, there's um, telling I, just, right now. I just think it's super, super exciting that we all like here. Um, I'm super happy and blessed to have met everybody, to be honest. Um, I would love for more people to like think about this space and think about how we actually make data an asset for everybody and how to put people first. And I think that's really what we need to do. And so I'm super, super excited what's ahead of us. Great. That was a great note to end on. Let's figure out how to put people first, down to the data first. point.